good singing, church. If a preacher can't preach after that, he just don't have much preach in him. <laughs> the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verse 20, is the focal verse of the message today as we bring to a conclusion our series entitled The Bedrock of Baptist Belief. We've been talking about doctrines that we as Southern Baptists believe in and are stated in our Baptist faith and message. There are more than eight, but I did want to cover at least these eight in this series. This morning I'm going to speak to the subject of last things. Sometimes you will hear the phrase last days. The King James Version likes the phrase latter days. But I'm going to use the phrase from the Baptist statement, our Baptist faith and message statement that uses last things. I think the best place to go to consider the subject of last things is the last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 22. In this chapter, three times the Lord Jesus says, I am coming quickly. In verse 17, we find the last invitation in the scripture. It says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirst come. Whoever desires. Oh, I love that word, whoever. Whosoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. The last invitation in the Bible is the word come. But look at verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. John, the, God, the writer here of Revelation, responds to those words of Jesus with Amen. And then says, Even so come, Lord Jesus. John is calling on an Aramaic term, that was often used in the early church. It's the word Maranatha. Perhaps you've heard that word. It means Lord come. Lord Jesus come. That was John's response. Even so come Lord Jesus. Two lawyers, best friends, were talking one day. One said to the other, in amazement, I am surprised you're going to be a Sunday school teacher at the church. The friend said, I bet you don't even know the Lord's Prayer. The other, deacon, the other lawyer said, sure I do. Everybody knows that prayer. It's Lord, I lay me down to sleep. <laughs> the other lawyer friend responded, I didn't know you knew so much about the Bible. The Bible is the book of the ages. It tells us of the first days through the last days. The first days deals with the creation of all things. And the last days deals with the, com the uh, consummation of all things toward which everything is moving. It seems that man is never satisfied with what God tells us, we want to know more than what he's chosen to reveal to us in his word. The account of the first days is brief. One chapter, 31 verses, there in the book of Genesis, God tells us he created all things and man was the apex or the crown of his creation. But we want to know more. 
Archbishop James Usher in the 1600s started with the first known date in the Bible and moving back with the genealogies offered in the Scripture, he placed creation in 4004 B.C. Answers in Genesis gives the same date. I believe the world is much younger than some scientists say it is. From Adam to Abraham was 2,000 years. From Abraham to Christ, about 2,000 years. And from Christ to today, just over 2,000 years. You see, I believe the earth is about 6,000 years old. The aging of the fossils that scientists use to insist that the earth is old is just theory. They can be disputed. Well, preacher, you know the Bible says to God a day is a thousand years. Well, listen, when the creation narrative speaks of night and day being the first day and night and day being the second day and so on, Moses is using the Hebrew word yom, which means a literal 24-hour day. God created creation, all of creation, in six literal days. But since we're not satisfied with the revelation God has given us concerning the first days, we want to add to it. We want to add our theories to what God has given us as truth. Now listen, if you think we're a reluctant to accept what God says about the first days, we have been even more reluctant to accept what God says about the last days. Did you know some 14 times in Scripture you find that phrase in some form, the phrase the last days? God makes no attempt to tell us the details and dates about all the events, when they will happen or how they will happen, just they will happen. But I can tell you, the last days is defined in the Bible as that time from the ascension of Christ to the return of Christ to this earth. The early church believed that the Lord's return was imminent. They believe that the return of the Lord could happen in their lifetime. We are today living in the last days. And while God revealed to us a great deal about the last days, and while there are some wonderful uh, interpreters of prophecy alive today who can take the prophetic narrative of the last days and shed light upon it, No one knows every detail of the last days. But not satisfied with the revelation. People, scholars have developed theories of how it all will come to pass. But it has left the church confused and divided. The study of end times is called eschatology. Concerning beliefs of the last days, Southern Baptists have not agreed on one certain theory. There are several theories considered among Christians, and there are several considered among great Baptists, Baptists of great influence through the years. George W. Truitt of the early 1900s, the pastor at First Baptist Dallas was a post-millennialist. Those who hold this view believe a thousand years or millennial reign of Christ is symbolic and means just a long period of time. They believe that this period runs concurrently with the church age and Christ is already reigning over his kingdom from heaven. 
They believe this world will become better and better and better as Christians establish God's kingdom upon this earth. And when this earth is Christianized, the Lord will return. Billy Graham was a premillennialist. This is the view that Christ will return and establish a millennial reign or a thousand year reign of Christ upon the earth. This view holds the rapture of the church followed by seven years of tribulation which is then followed by the return of Christ to this earth. Within this theory, there are views about the rapture. Some believe in pre-tribulation rapture, mid-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture. So you have the post you have the premillennialist Herschel Hobbes. Matter of fact, the one who edited and worked so diligently upon our Baptist faith and message, he was an amillennialist. The A means no, no millennial. It is much like post-millennialism, but evil and good will struggle upon the earth. Lawlessness and falling away from the church will come. The persecution of Christians will increase. Then Christ will return. Prophetic events are believed to have already happened or are symbolic. Now, friend, all of these men believe the Bible to be inspired authoritative and sufficient. They just interpreted it differently. Thomas Jefferson once said, good people with good intentions and the same facts don't always agree. That is true in the issue of last days. It can be so complicated and so confusing, it's led Psalm Baptist to say, I'm just a pan-millennialist. It'll all pan out in the end. I am thankful that Southern Baptists have not made eschatology a test for fellowship and cooperation. Now, I don't believe that Jesus meant for us to have all the details of the last days. Acts chapter 1 verse 7 says, It is not for you to know the times nor the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Matthew chapter 24, 6, But at that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Herschel Hobbes tells us, Jesus did not speak of his return in terms of time, but in terms of condition. When the condition is right, the time will be right. No, God didn't choose to give us every little detail of the end times, but listen, he gave us all that we need. So rather than speculate about how and when, I want us to concentrate on a few basics, things we know for certain, things that Southern Baptists can agree on that will happen in the end times. There are five of them, and I'm going to give them to you by way of outline this morning. Everyone starts with an R. First of all, we Southern Baptists believe in the return of Christ. Friend, our world hasn't seen the last of Christ. John 14, 3, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The angel, Acts chapter 1, verse 11, promised those Followers, those early followers gazing into the skies. This same Jesus that you saw go up from the earth will so come in like manna. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter 3.10, his return will be sudden. It will be like a thief in the night. Friend, his return will be triumphant. He came the first time in humility. 
He will come the second time in glory. He came the first time to suffer. He will come the second time to reign. He came the first time for salvation. But he will come the second time for judgment. His return will be personal. His return will be visible. This same Jesus, as you have seen go up, will so come in like manna. A scholar has estimated that there are 1,845 references to Christ's second coming in the Old Testament. There are 318 references to the second coming of Christ in the New Testament. That's an amazing one out of every 30 verses. Scholars tell us for every prophecy concerning the Lord's first coming, there are eight that speak of his second coming. The Bible clearly teaches Jesus will return. Vance Havner once wrote, the early believers were not looking for something to happen. They were looking for someone to come. Looking for the train to arrive is one thing. But looking for someone you love on that train is a different matter. Adrian Rogers once said, I don't want to be on the program committee. I want to be on the welcoming committee. Christ will return. Southern Baptists believe Jesus is coming again. Number two, Southern Baptists believe in the resurrection from the dead. While in Thessalonica, Paul had spoken to the church about Christians being caught up, taken away, raptured to be with the Lord in the air. But in the meantime, some of these believers had died and been buried. And those who were alive were worried about their loved ones who had already died and what part they would play in the Lord's glorious return. So Paul wrote the church, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 17, saying, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. In Paul's response, he only spoke of what would happen among believers. He wanted them to know the part that they all would play when the Lord returned. This is the order he gave. Christ returns in the air. The dead will be resurrected. The living believers will be caught up without having to go through the death process. And we will always be with the Lord. And then he says, comfort one another with these words. Not everybody believes in a bodily resurrection. There are some who believe in total annihilation. That when you die, is it. It's over. Your body is placed. Your body is burned, whichever you choose. But it simply disintegrates and everything is over. There are some who believe in reincarnation. After death, the person returns as some other creature. But Baptists believe in the central teaching of Jesus who told Martha, your brother will live again. Martha replied, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall never or shall, shall always live even though he dies. I read about a young man that went to his boss, asked for the next day off 
because he needed to go to the funeral of his grandmother? The boss said, sure. The day after he returned, he called that boy into his office and asked him, young man, do you believe in the resurrection of the dead? The young man said, yes. The boss said, good, because yesterday while you were at the funeral, your grandmother came by for a visit. <laughs> Friend, listen. Southern Baptists believe there's going to be a great getting up morning. Our bodies will be, be raised up triumphantly from the grave and we'll have this transformed bodily existence for all eternity. Thirdly, we Southern Baptists believe, believe in the review of life. We believe that there's a judgment day coming, both for believers and non-believers. And in this day of comfort, comfortable fellowship, we don't like to discuss judgment. But we believe that one day we're going to stand before God and our body, I mean our, our lives are going to be reviewed Paul wrote, pertaining to the Christian, 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we all must appear in the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, both good or bad. Friend, the Bible teaches that our lives will be reviewed. Now you might be thinking, well, preacher, if salvation is a matter of faith, not works, why would God judge us on our works? Well, listen, the purpose of this judgment for the Christian is not to determine our destiny. That's decided on the earth by accepting or rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. But, our, but the works determine our rewards in eternity. We're saved by faith, but we're rewarded according to our works. And according to Scripture, our works will be revealed on this day. Even the hidden things will be judged. 1 Corinthians 3.13 Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each work of what sort it is. This both frightens and assures or reassures the Christian. Not only will hypocrisy be revealed, but those who have been falsely accused will be vindicated. The hidden things will stand out through the fire of God's promise or presence. The Bible teaches we're going to be judged according to the knowledge of according to our knowledge of truth. According to the opportunities given to us, we're going to be judged according to our words, by the same standards we judge others, by the way we treat others with kindness, compassion, or indifference. We're going to be judged on all of these things. One writer said, my greatest free, uh, fear is to be standing there before God and next to me is Mother Teresa and in the final judgment, Hear God say to Mother Teresa, you should have done more. <laughs> that would frighten me too. Listen, one thing is sure. God's judgment will be just. Nobody will stand before God in judgment and say, it wasn't fair. Because God is just. Oh no, friend, we'll all get the reward we deserve. You say, preacher, what about the unbeliever? Revelation chapter 20 talks about the judgment of the unbeliever. It's called the great white throne judgment. And in the words of the great R.G. Lee, there's a payday someday. Here's number four. Southern Baptists believe in the residence of eternity. Yeah, for eternity we're going to live somewhere. We're going to reside somewhere in a place called heaven or a place called hell. Now there is no mistaking that Jesus taught about a place called hell. It's a place of suffering, a place of remembering, a place of despair, and a place of no escape. 
Vance Havner, again, let me quote him, said his father was converted, converted by the preaching of a hair-raising fire and brimstone sermon that scared him into the kingdom of God. And then he added, such preaching is discouraged these days, but it's better to scare men into heaven than to lull them into hell. Better shocked than stupefied. Just as surely as there is a hell, there's a heaven. The Bible talks about Abraham, a nomad, living in tents, looking for a solid foundation. The only foundation that he knew was the sands, his tent driven in the sand, the stakes driven into sand. Driven by faith, he looked for a city, the Bible says, where there was a solid foundation whose builder and maker was God. He was looking for a permanent house. In Revelation chapter 22, John describes for us this permanent home for us. In heaven, there's no more sea. You know what that means? There's nothing there that can separate us. There'll be no more tears. There won't be anything there to sadden us. There'll be no death. There'll be no grieving there. There'll be no pain. Nothing in heaven will cause us any kind of hurt. There'll be no night there. You know what that means? There'll be nothing there to frighten us. Heaven is that kind of place. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared person. All right, number five and finally. This is what Southern Baptists believe, that we, his people, are resolved, we're resolute to the end. A teacher was lecturing on perseverance. He said he drove straight to his goal, he looked neither to his right nor to his left, but pressed forward, moving in a definite purpose. Neither friend nor foe could delay him nor turn him from his course. All who crossed his path did so at his own peril. What would you say is such a man? One student raised his hand and said, a truck driver. Y'all with me? Consider that word perseverance just a moment. It comes from the two words, the, pre, the prefix per, which means through. It's coupled with the word severe. It means to keep pressing on, trusting God, going on with God, even in those very severe circumstances, even when those moments that you're hurting and you want to give up, perseverance. Southern Baptists believe you persevere, you endure to the end with Jesus. Matthew 24, 13. Mark 13, 13. Teach us. Hear it. He that shall endure to the end shall be saved. Oh, we love that phrase, once saved, always saved. I believe in the security of the believer. Most Southern Baptists do, but listen. If you'll endure to the end, if you'll persevere to the end, you won't have to worry about once saved, always saved. And neither will your family. The Spirit of God comes to live in us. And when we believe in Him and the presence comes in us, we can persevere. We have the strength. We have the security to persevere to the end. Let me give you Jude. Verses 24 and 25, Jude tells us what Christ does for us. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Friend, friend listen, we're not only saved by grace, we are sustained by grace and we are presented or secured by grace. Friends, Southern Baptists believe in hanging on to the end. That's what the Bible teaches. 
Hang on until the end. Thomas A. Kempis once said, There is no escaping from tribulation and sorrow except to bear it patiently. Friend, listen, here's some good news. If you're not afraid to face the music, one day you may get to lead the band. We're going to be living in days of increasing persecution toward the Christian. You're going to be tempted to give up on Jesus. You're going to be tempted to fall away back into this world. But the testimony that your faith is genuine is that you will endure to the end. Three preachers were discussing this question. When Jesus returns, which church will he go to? The Episcopalian said, he will go to the Episcopal church because of our line of apostolic succession. The holiness pastor said, he would go to the holiness church because of our enthusiasm. The Baptist said, of course he'll go to the Baptist church. Why should he change after all these years? We Southern Baptists want to make Jesus a Southern Baptist. He's not a Southern Baptist. But I want to tell you what we believe about him. We believe he's coming back. We do know that everything he says about the last days will come true. Some things are not ours to know. So the main thing is that we be ready. We be ready. I'll close. A preacher preached on this same scripture one Sunday, stressing that glorious, or those glorious words of Jesus, surely I come quickly. He said that phrase several times in his sermon, and when he came to his close in prayer, he, he hit it again. But while he was praying, he was conscious of a woman getting up and walking out because in that day their dresses would swish when they walked. He finished his prayer, concluded the service, walked back to the back of the church and there was this woman pacing back and forth, pacing back and forth. And when she saw the preacher, she came to him and said, Preacher, how dare you preach like that? How dare you say, come, Lord Jesus, come. I don't want him to come. Because if he comes, he's going to mess up all my plans. And that wise preacher said, ma'am, he's coming whether you want him to or not. Jesus said, I come quickly. I join it with John saying, Maranatha, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. He's coming. 